I have the very great pleasure of introducing this year's commencement speaker. Where to begin? Activist and best-selling author, courageous truth teller, trailblazer, teacher, editor, organizer, icon, phenomenal human being, and friend, Gloria Steinem. Thank you, Gloria, for being here, for weathering jet lag and dictators, <laughs> coming almost directly from walking uh, with a brave and determined group of women across the demilitarized zone dividing North and South Korea. Not every commencement speaker can say that that's where they just came from. <clears throat> for over five decades, Gloria has been at the forefront of the most important social and cultural debates of our time. She has dedicated her life continues to dedicate her life to exposing the intertwined nature of sexism, racism, and economics. Gloria is relentlessly resolute and revolutionary. Gloria Steinem is perhaps best known for founding Ms. Magazine, the first US magazine to put issues like domestic violence and sexual harassment on the cover, thereby bringing them into the light and into the national conversation. Her deep roots in journalism enable her to reflect society even as she shapes it. Gloria understands that if journalism is the first draft of history, women must have a hand in the former to shape the latter. A lot of her work, including Ms. and the Women's Media Center, has focused on equal representation of women and the full breadth of women's issues in the national media. And while we could say these are women's issues, they are more properly human issues. On a personal note, I have learned an enormous amount from Gloria, from what she has written and said, surely. Her work reveals both the big and small injustices and measures progress in our long, slow arc toward equality. But I have also learned so much just by being in her presence at the simplest of moments, having a cup of tea, lucky me. But Gloria's greatness is not grandiose. Her greatness is in being so fully and completely human in all of her interactions because of her deeply held belief that the humanity of others is fundamental and undeniable in every moment, at every turn. Her belief that to deny another's humanity, be it in law or in a small seeming interpersonal interaction, anyone, is in itself deeply inhumane. As a writer, Gloria has received the, <clears throat> you ready for the list? The Penny Missouri Journalism Award, the Front Page and Clarion Awards, National Magazine Awards, an Emmy Citation for Excellence in Television Writing, the Lifetime Achievement in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Society of Writers Award from the United Nations. She is a recipient of the National Gay Rights Advocates Award, the Liberty Award of the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Series Medal from the United Nations, and she is a member of the National Women's Hall of Fame. Parenting Magazine conferred on her its Lifetime Achievement Award for her work in promoting girls' self-esteem, and Biography Magazine listed her as one of the 25 most influential women in America. For her role in changing the way the country saw women, and even how women saw themselves, perhaps most, perhaps most importantly, how women saw themselves. She, awarded, she was awarded the 2013 Presidential Medal of Freedom. She also founded the Women's Action Alliance, the National Women's Political Caucus, the Voters for Choice, Choice USA, and Take Our Daughters to Work Day. I know that she's immediately going to correct me and say co-founded, so I'll just say it. <laughs> As a professional, I am deeply grateful to come of age in the wake of her influence. Her work articulates, expects, demands that all people have sovereignty over their own lives. And it has helped give shape to all of ours. She pushes women to become leaders, to be the leaders they are. And she showed us how to do it. She still shows us how to do it. The fruits of her labor are evident not only in her list of accomplishments, of which I only took a little portion, 
but in the ways that we think and talk about equality, rights, and possibility, how we engage in the processes of change. They are embedded in our aspirations. When asked to whom she is passing her torch, she has responded that she is keeping her torch, thank you very much, <laughs> and she is using it to light the torches of others. Now there's a one sentence lesson in leadership, remember it. I would say that I am proud to stand on the shoulders of trailblazers, including Gloria, but I think she would say that we're all working side by side in the march toward equality and justice for all. So thank you for coming to our side tonight, Gloria. In tribute to the real, <laughs> let me just say that there is no way that I can live up to your <laughs> expectations. <laughs> also, that listening, seeing Mariko, listening, seeing all of you, is so such a gift to me. You have no idea how you uh, you braced for my favorite word, fan fucking tastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in 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 real life, everybody, including Lacan. <laughs> is I, th I like, you know those nests of Russian dolls in which there's the littlest person in the center and then they go like that and so, I think we're all like that. So I just wanna say to you that I have never escaped the moment like now at which I lose all of my saliva. <laughs> Each tooth acquires a little Angora sweater with nervousness, <laughs> I can't get my upper lip over it. <laughs> um, and I think, how did a writer like me ever get to, you know, be speaking in public like this? And the truth is that I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that I couldn't get published what <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get published, especially at the beginning of the women's movement. And so I began to go out with another brave co-speaker, and I discovered something magic courtesy of that, which is that when we are in a room, with all five senses, we can understand each other and empathize with each other in a way that is beyond what we do on the printed page or on the screen. It turns out, according to my friendly, brilliant neurologist, that we do not produce the same hormone that allows us to empathize, the oxytocin, it's called, uh, that floods us, for instance, men and women, when we hold a child, when we are in each other's presence. It, it doesn't happen unless we are here. That is one of the many ways, I think, in which restriction leads to liberation. If I had been able to publish what it was that I wished to publish, I never would have discovered the magic of being in a room like this together. So I, I hope that you will forgive me if I tell you that graduations are my most favorite <laughs> event <laughs> of all kind. I love commencements. I love the moment, the, the ceremony. Um, it's all of you, it's the graduates, it's uh, everybody who, all, all the family, the friends, uh, the lovers, the old lovers, you know who you are. <laughs> um, everybody who helped pay the bill. <laughs> it is all of us coming together in this extraordinary moment that I am such a sucker for. I just can't, it's, the, these events are, are more permanent than weddings, right? <laughs> um, 
are more than diverse, more diverse than most religious ceremonies, more freely chosen than almost any other kind of uh, group ritual. And I'm so grateful to you that you've invited me, an outlander, to come and share this great, great occasion. <laughs> now, of course, I've been worrying about what I could possibly say that might be helpful at a time like this of both ending and beginning. And my only comfort has been remembering that in my case of college education, what was helpful was always completely unpredictable uh, and often something I only realized was helpful many, many years later. For instance, here's one example. I took a course in geology feeling that it was the easiest way to fulfill my science requirement. <laughs> And our professor took us out on a field trip to see the cut-off meander curves of an old age river, the Connecticut River. I, of course, was paying no attention to his lecture <laughs> because I had seen on the dirt road leading to the river a gigantic mud turtle, like this big, uh, who had crawled up the dirt road and was in the muddy embankment leading to an asphalt road. And it was clear to me that this turtle was about to continue onto that road and be crushed by a car. So I picked up the enormous snapping angry turtle <laughs> and with great difficulty, I carried it down the path to the river. I had just slipped it into the water and was watching it swim away when the professor came up behind me and said, you know, that turtle has probably spent a month crawling up that path <laughs> to lay its eggs in the muddy embankment. Right? And you have just put it back in the room. I felt terrible, <laughs> but it was too late. The turtle was already swimming away. And only in later years, when I'd become a traveling organizer, only then did I realize the huge lesson I had learned. Always ask the turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there, there are lots of correlates, the corollaries of that, right? Anybody who's experienced something is probably more expert in it than the experts. Even well-meaning programs, whether they are from governments or foundations, often make the mistake of making decisions up here and thinking that they have the solution that they can just drop down. So even if it's the right solution, it prevents the turtle <laughs> from flexing the muscles that allow us to discover who we are and be, be self-determining. And now, whenever I hear someone in a foundation or a government position offer to uh, say things like, uh, is it replicable? Can you scale it up? I know we're in deep shit. <laughs> so I just give that as an example. <laughs> the, Many of the things you have learned here, and hopefully even some one thing, maybe I will say, I don't know, with luck, may or may not be helpful or may or may not be something that we only recognize in many years to come. But only that, only the turtle, has given me the courage to come to you today <laughs> <laughs> and hope, hope that it might be useful. Um, I think that Graduation is a time when we uh, think about changes that we want to move us toward kindness, perhaps the most single human, important human quality ever, uh, and to seek justice and to make the change we want to make. We tend to feel that it has to be started from above, and actually that is probably the opposite of the case too. 
It depends on what we do every day. It is those small increments that make the difference. And I think if I were to put any difference on the era into which you are graduating than the ones before you, I would say that it is now the time to focus on connections. It is often said that God is in the details, right? I think the goddess is in the connections. <laughs> So, and this is not to say that all the previous stages were not necessary, they were necessary. Everyone who is emerging needs to have a time in which the problem or the person or the whatever it is that's unique or invisible comes forward and is identified and begins to tell their story. Nothing is more important than narrative, than stories. We haven't been sitting around campfires for 100,000 years telling our stories for nothing. Our brains are organized on narrative. If you tell me a fact, I will invent a story as to why that fact is true. So when we have been invisible unfairly in this world for any reason, whatever that reason is, it's terribly, terribly important that we first are able to name ourselves, to come forward, to tell our story, and usually what happens is that we tell what we think is an unsayable story even, a shameful story, and certainly ours alone. And then we hear six other people or a hundred other people or many other groups say, that happened to you? That happened to me too. And we begin to realize that if it has happened to unique human beings, and we each are unique, then it must be political, it must be about power. And if we come together in any way, we can begin to change it. <laughs> so that is, step, that is uh, an irreplaceable step. And coming together in groups is an irreplaceable step. And so for good and constructive, good, great and constructive reasons, of course, this means that there has been a civil rights movement based on shared experiences of lethal discrimination from voting to education and now to the unequal law enforcement that has given us a movement called Black Lives Matter. Of course we have to have that named movement. And my hope is that this uh, contagious, uh, the fact is that this contagious emotion, because, you know, Justice is a very contagious idea. Uh, gave birth to a huge movement still going in Indian country where people had not been allowed to control even their own schools, were put into boarding schools with the sole purpose of uh, killing the Indian, saving the man, as the inventor of those boarding schools said, so that they could not control, their, they could not teach their own language, their own spiritual ceremonies, there was a great amount of abuse and even murders in those schools. And because of the civil rights movement and the contagion of the civil rights movement, the American Indian movement was born. And because within the American Indian movement and the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam movement, movements we love, still the women in those movements were not playing an equal role, really, because nobody really knew what an equal role looked like, right? And yet the idea of equality and justice and shared humanity was so strong that it gave birth to a big and diverse and spread out women's movement, again by contagion. So all of those are important, important steps and becoming visible and organized at different times, uh, as we have seen, um, is crucial. But I fear that now we are seen in silos. You know, there is the women's movement, there is the gay and lesbian and transgender movement, there is the peace movement, there is the, and the truth of the matter is, as we know, that every single one of these movements is inextricably connected to the next. 
I fear sometimes that our adversaries know this better than we do. Because you may have noticed, we pretty much have the same adversaries. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was saying earlier today that on campuses, one of the questions asked me is, why is it that the same groups are against lesbians and birth control? <laughs> <laughs> it seems irrational on the surface, but it is not. <laughs> because in fact, the opposite view of ours <laughs> is that reproduction must be controlled. And that means women's bodies. If we didn't have wombs, we might be fine. Who knows? <laughs> but reproduction must be controlled. I live for the day when every economic course starts not with production, but reproduction. <laughs> uh, and they understand, that from their point of view, all sexuality is wrong, immoral, should be outlawed, unless it can end in reproduction. So of course they are against family planning and safe and legal abortion and any expression of love between two women, between two men, because this all stands for non-reproductive sexuality. And in fact, they have been telling us for years and years a lie about human sexuality. It has always been a way we communicate with each other, we bond with each other, as well as a way we procreate if we choose to. I think that human beings, although at this point I always worry that I'm maligning animals in some way, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that, that human beings are kind of more or less the only species who experience equal sexual pleasure whether we can conceive or not. And so that tells us that the purpose of human sexuality has always been about communication. But with patriarchy, with racism, with class, with everything that we know, uh, with the ownership of children, we have reached a point at which we have been told, and I bet in this room this sounds familiar, that sexuality is only moral and okay when it can end in reproduction and takes place inside patriarchal marriage so the children are properly owned. So I think we begin to see that sometimes our adversaries know better <laughs> the, uh, what our connections are and we have to begin to understand them. We have to begin to understand that there is no way that racism can be perpetuated without controlling reproduction. And so wherever there is racism, it is bad for females of that race and every race. It may affect females differently. The females of the supposedly ruling group may be restricted uh, sexually and physically uh, and put on a pedestal. As, as a uh, black suffragist said to her white suffragist sisters, a pedestal is as much a prison as any other small space. <laughs> um, and it may affect women of color differently because they become sexual possessions of everyone and the producers of cheap labor. It isn't that it affects us all the same, but it affects us. And there is no such thing as a successful feminist movement that is not anti-racist, and there is no such thing as an anti-racist movement that can be successful without also being feminist. And so we begin... <laughs> we, I think we begin to see what our connections are. Now, some of our connections we're just beginning to be able to prove. We've always known, for instance, in tribal societies, that the more polarized the gender roles, the more violence in the society, the more porous and chosen roles, the less violence in society. But now, thanks to a book called Sex and World Peace, which I commend to you, it's a greatly researched book, and it is readable. How rare is that? <laughs> it, 
It has looked at, uh, scholars have looked at pretty much every modern country and determined that the single greatest determinant of whether um, there is violence inside the country or whether there will, that country will be willing to use military violence against another country is not actually poverty. It is not lack of natural resources. It is not religion. It is not even degree of democracy. It's violence against females. Not because females are any more valuable than males, no. But because patriarchy demands control of reproduction and that becomes the model we see first. We, we see uh, the controller and the controlled. We see the dominant and the passive. It normalizes that for everything else, for race, for class, for hierarchy in general. So I hope that we, as women, in seeing the connection, because sometimes you know, we can't, we've been so trained not to fight for ourselves, it's tough for us to fight for ourselves. If we see it as the root cause, of hierarchy and domination and violence. I hope we are more likely to understand that we are not only fighting for ourselves, but fighting for a greater purpose. And we are also helping to point out that masculinity is a prison too. It may be a better prison with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and people, <laughs> <laughs> people to serve you coffee, but <laughs> we once at Ms. Magazine tried to figure out um, if you backed out of the statistics on why men die, uh, if you backed out those things that could be reasonably attributed to the masculine role of what would happen, you know, uh, accidents and uh, gun-related violence, uh, tension, disease, uh, you know. And it turned out that men lived four or five years longer w without the masculine role. Okay, so what other movement has, can offer you? <laughs> So I hope, I hope, I hope we begin to see the, the connections. Um, so it, with this in mind, I have followed the advice of David Letterman, <laughs> <laughs> who was still doing it when I was, okay. Uh, and and I, I have tried to do 10 top pieces of advice <laughs> that I give to myself, just in case they might be useful to you as, as graduates, right? Um, see if any of these help you, and don't feel you have to take any of them all, or take all of them, because some of them are quite controversial, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, number 10. If it looks like a duck, and walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, but you think it's a pig, it's a pig. <laughs> Trust your instinct. Your instinct is like a computer, and the facts are like long division on a piece of old paper or something. Like Trust your instinct. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Marx and Engels were smart about a lot of things, mainly because they were inspired by the Iroquois Confederacy, incidentally inspired by what was on this ground. Hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> but not about the end justifying the means. Actually, the means dictate the ends. We won't have laughter and kindness and poetry and pleasure at the end of any revolution unless we have laughter and kindness and poetry and pleasure along the way. Eight, laughter is the most revolutionary emotion because it is free. It is the only emotion that is free. Fear can be compelled, as we know. Even love can be compelled if we're kept isolated and dependent for long enough. In order to survive, we enmesh with our captor and believe we are in love. The Stockholm Syndrome happens to men too, right? But laughter is an aha of understanding that comes when known things coincide and make something brand new. It's an orgasm of the mind, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Einstein ha said he had, Einstein could not possibly have said everything that he said, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> uh, Einstein had to be careful while shaving because when he suddenly had an aha, he thought of something new, he laughed and he cut himself. <laughs> Do not go any place they won't let you laugh. Big important rule, right? including religious places. <laughs> the, it's the difference actually between spirituality and religion. Religion doesn't laugh, let you laugh, spirituality does. Okay. Uh, seven, there's more variation among groups than between groups. Uh, as we can see, that we know that masculine and feminine are creations, very powerful cultural creations, but still creations, just as uh, the ideas of race and class are creations. So when making any generalized statement about women and men, substitute, say, Gentiles and Jews, whites and blacks, rich and poor. If it's still acceptable, okay, but if it's not, it's not acceptable. <laughs> All right, so, right. Uh, six. For 95% of human history, spirituality saw God in all living things. Then God was gradu gradually withdrawn over millennia from women and nature. Have any of you taken the trip down or up the Nile? You know, from because you can see it in the carvings along the Nile. You can see that in the oldest African uh, part. God is present in papyrus and men and women and flowers and everything. Then it's a little, you get back in the boat, it's a thousand years later, the goddess has a son and no daughter. Then <laughs> there's less nature, you get back in the boat, it's another thousand years. Finally, the uh, son grows up to be a consort. Then the pharaoh sits on a throne, a male pharaoh sits on a throne that is the goddess. And then you get to mosques, which like Christian churches and others are built on top of the ancient ruins. Uh, and in Moss, no representation of women or nature uh, is allowed. Uh, as Henry Breasted, a very smart Egyptologist said, monotheism is but imperialism in religion. Think about it. <laughs> Five. This follows four, I mean six, you'll see. Religion is often politics in the sky, <laughs> and we have to say so. Right. It's the only politics that has managed to put itself off limits and continue to be powerful. When God looks like the ruling class, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> When uh, all the priesthood is guys, it's an even deeper problem. When we're told to, to obey in order to get a reward after death, I mean, <laughs> even corporations only do it for after retirement. <laughs> And incidentally, heaven didn't exist in a very specific form, you know, in that way that it does now in various monotheisms in great detail. Uh, in, in egalitarian cultures, uh, it, it was, you know, you went to join your ancestors, but there wasn't this elaborate system of, of punishment and, and reward. I'm feeling really tempted to do something I <laughs> probably shouldn't do. <laughs> Okay, well, one day I was reading a, <laughs> a, uh, a historian of religious architecture, and he said, like everybody knows it, that um, patriarchal the structures of patriarchal religions are built to resemble the body of a woman. Because the central ceremony they house is one of men giving birth. Yes, they've taken over reproduction and controlled reproduction, but it's still a big mythic, th mythic thing, right? Giving birth, okay. So, as he explains, and you can find it now, thanks to Google, I believe, <laughs> that, 
there is always an outer entrance and inner entrance, labia majora, labia minora, and a vestibula in between. It's actually <laughs> the, the same word physically as it is. A vaginal aisle up the center. Two curved ovarian structures on either side. And the womb in this, I knew I shouldn't do this. <laughs> And the womb, the, with the, the, the altar in the center, which is the womb, where the miracle takes place. Where men say, yes, you were born of woman, inferior creature, sex, dirty stuff, nasty break. But <laughs> if you obey the rules of the patriarchy, we will sprinkle imitation birth fluid over your head, <laughs> give you a new name, and you will be reborn through the patriarchy. In skirts, they have the nerve. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm actually serious. When you were a kid, didn't you wonder why Jesus was blonde and blue-eyed, a Jewish guy in the middle of the Middle East? <laughs> It's, it's, it's about, it's about uh, sex and race and class and, you know, if God looks like the ruling class, the ruling class is God. All right, and we have to do something about this. And I, I had to go for a very minor um, test in a hospital and they gave me one of those forms to fill out where it says religion because in case you drop dead, they want to know who to call. Right? <laughs> And at first I put none, and then I thought it was a little negative. So, <laughs> so I put pagan. <laughs> and the nurse said to me, what does that mean? I said, it just means you believe that there is an essence of godliness in all living things, all living things. I converted her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, now here's a more practical one <laughs> for the Golden Rule was written by smart folks for those who were kind of superior or controlling their own lives, and it's very important. Treat others as you would want to be treated, very important. Uh, but women and men who've been treated as inferior need to reverse it. You need to treat yourself as well as you treat other people. Three, <laughs> labeling, as I was saying, makes the invisible visible. So naming ourselves, it's all very important, but it's limiting. We've had a declaration of independence. I think now we need a declaration of interdependence about the connections, right? So uh, categories are the enemy of connecting. And here's what I think we can think and so we can use as an image instead. We are linked, we are not ranked. We are linked with each other, we are linked with nature. And the paradigm becomes a circle, not a pyramid. And this paradigm of the old culture, original cultures was, as we know, a circle, not a paradigm, whether they were not a pyramid, whether they were in Africa or here, they shared the idea of, of the circle. Um, because um, we ha only have all of our five senses in the present, we can't live in the past or future. This one I'm really talking to myself because I live in the future. <laughs> And you can't, as it happens. You can only be alive in the present. Right now is all there is. One, this is the last one. <laughs> if even, this is to say there, you know, not only did it exist before, not only might you say that everything we want once was here in some form, it's not human nature to be hierarchical and divided. Um, so this is my last and hopeful one. 
If even one generation were born without ranking, and without violence, without shaming, and raised without shaming or violence or ranking, we have no idea what might be possible on this fragile spaceship Earth that we love so much. And you, the graduates of 2015, are part of that future, so part of that future. And I, and so many of us here, well, I'm going to live to 100, so I'll be with you for a while. <laughs> But um, eventually, and the parents and everybody here, we won't be with you. And yet we will. We'll always be with you. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this. Thing.